Thank you for listening to the official podcast of Canyon Creek Baptist Church, where our goal is to know Jesus and make Jesus known. To learn more about Canyon Creek, visit us online at creekfamily.org. Today's sermon comes from Pastor Josh Murray. All right. Well, hey, good morning again. I'm so glad you're here this morning uh, as we gather together to wrap up our series in the book of Jonah. If you have your Bible, you can turn to me or swipe with me, whatever's easier for you, to Jonah chapter four. Uh, That's where we're going to be today. But I want to catch you up on what's happened with Jonah so far. Uh, Jonah is a prophet, and God called him to go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it. Uh, Jonah didn't want to do this, so he hopped on a boat and set sail 2,500 miles in the opposite direction and ended up in the middle of a huge storm, Uh, and the sailors couldn't make it through the storm, so they threw Jonah overboard. That was his recommendation. Uh, He was swallowed by a really big fish, and after spending three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land, Uh, so Jonah finally ends up going to Nineveh, and he preaches a very short sermon. It was seven words in our English translation, but in the Hebrew language that Jonah actually preached it in, it was only five words. And Jonah shows up, he preaches this five-word sermon, and the entire city falls to their knees in repentance, 120,000 people, which brings us to Jonah chapter four, all right? Now, after this incredible moment in chapter three, where the entire city of Nineveh repents and turns to God, you would think that this would be like the pinnacle moment of Jonah's career as a prophet. Let's think about that for a minute. Success for a prophet or a preacher couldn't get much bigger or better than this, right? Jonah preached a five-word sermon and 120,000 people turned to God. This is like the equivalent of 100 Super Bowl wins for a preacher, all right? If this were to happen today, Jonah would be invited to speak at every conference. He would have all the book deals. This is a pinnacle career moment in Jonah's life. So then you would expect chapter four, the final chapter, to be sort of like a capstone part of the story. In chapter four, we would expect Jonah to to celebrate what just happened. A whole city came to faith in God because of a five-word sermon. We would expect him to celebrate that work. We would expect that he would go on to establish some churches and maybe some discipleship programs in Nineveh, or or maybe even that he would meet the girl of his dreams and they ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. That's kind of the story ending that we want for Jonah, isn't it? That's what we would expect to happen in this final chapter. But what actually happens is very different than that. And I want us to start with just the first verse of Jonah chapter four. Okay, so the entire city of Nineveh has just repented. Revival broke out. Everyone turned to God. And here's what happens. Jonah chapter four, verse one. The Bible says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. What a strange response, okay? Notice, Jonah's not a little perturbed, okay? He's not a little bit bothered. He's not a little bit irritated, no. The Bible says he is greatly displeased and furious, okay? The literal translation in Hebrew says Jonah burned with anger. In Jonah chapter four, the Bible tells us how angry Jonah is four different times in 10 verses. And in two of those times, he's so angry that he doesn't even wanna live anymore. He's ready to die. That's how angry he is. He's like, God, just take me now. So are you noticing this strange contrast between what just happened in Jonah chapter three and how he's responding in chapter four? Are you noticing this contrast and this powerful move of God and how angry he is about it? This should have been celebrated. Jonah's enemies, they turned, they repented, they gave their lives to, to God. They're done with their wicked ways. They're finally changing I think the question that we need to ask is why in the world is Jonah so angry? And that's the question I hope to answer today. Here's what I know to be true about anger. Anger burns more intensely the closer it gets to what we treasure in our hearts. And we see in Jonah some anger that is burning very intensely. So I think we need to ask the question and try to figure out what is it that Jonah treasures so much in his heart that it's causing him to burn with such ferocity and anger. I'm glad you asked, because that's what we're gonna talk about today, all right? Let's take a look at verse two. 
It says, so Jonah prayed to the Lord. Here's this prayer. Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. Now, if you notice, Jonah just quoted Exodus chapter 34, which we actually read last week, where it talks about God's compassion. And Jonah's quoting this verse, this passage, as a way of saying, God, I know who you are. I know your character. I know your heart. I know that you're compassionate. I know that you're gracious. I know that you're merciful. I know that you abound in love. And I knew that if I went to Nineveh, that you might actually save them. He's saying, I knew that if I went and preached that you might have mercy on them. I knew that if I went to Nineveh, you might be gracious. And that's why I ran away. That's why I went to Tarshish. This is what Jonah's praying. In other words, he's saying, I didn't run to Tarshish because I was afraid of these barbaric Ninevites. He's saying, I ran to Tarshish because I knew that you would do what you just did. I knew that you would give them grace. I knew that you would show them mercy. I know that you would be compassionate towards them because that's who you are. Jonah's saying, God, they don't deserve this. Do you know what these people do? Right, they murder people. They cut off their heads. They skin them alive. They worship idols and false gods. They don't deserve your grace. What Jonah's really implying is they don't deserve this, but I do. I deserve this grace. That's what he's thinking. These Ninevites, man, they're bad. They don't deserve your grace. They deserve to suffer. They deserve punishment for what, they, what they've done. Jonah has some nationalism bubbling up in his heart. Maybe even a little bit of racism bubbling up in his heart. He has some superiority coming to the surface. And the funny thing is, he just quoted Exodus chapter 34. Here's what we learn from that. We learn that it's possible to know the word of God and miss the heart of God. And that's what's happening in Jonah's life. And that's what's happening in the church today. We have become perfectly content with knowing the word of God and completely missing on the heart of God. And that's what's happening in Jonah's life. Let's take a look at the next few verses. Verse three, Jonah's continuing his prayer. And this is how angry he is. He says, now, Lord... Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And look at this question God asked Jonah. He said, is it right for you to be angry? That's God's question for Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry? The Bible says Jonah left the city and found a place east of it, and he made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. So I want you to picture this, okay? Jonah's sitting with his beaver nuggets from Bucky's, right? (laughs) And some Dr. Pepper. And he's just watching to see what's gonna happen to Nineveh. In other words, he hasn't given up hope that God could still destroy these people. He hasn't given up hope that God will decide to pour out his wrath on these evil people. Verse six, The Bible says, then the Lord God appointed, everybody say appointed. God appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant, okay? Now, what trouble was this plant going to protect Jonah from? Remember, this is taking place in what we know as modern day Iraq, So Jonah's sitting in the middle of the blazing sun. It's probably like 120 degrees. So let's not underestimate the level of trouble that Jonah was prone to while he was watching Nineveh from a distance. So God, like he does, he appoints or provides a plant to give some shade for Jonah. And the Bible tells us that Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. But notice it, it uses the same word here in the Hebrew language where we just saw that he was greatly displeased and furious, greatly angry. It's the same descriptor, the same word to say now, the opposite of that, that he's greatly pleased. He's very happy with this plant. 
This pleasure that he was feeling was just as intense as his anger was. It's interesting to me, though, that throughout this entire story, Jonah's angry. This is the only time in the entire story of Jonah that we see him happy, okay? Now, notice, the Bible tells us that Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant, that he was happy about this plant, but it doesn't tell us that Jonah gave praise to God for the plant. It doesn't tell us that Jonah said, thank you, God, for this plant. He wasn't doing that at all. He wasn't praising the Lord for the plant that he gave him. He was just happy about the plant, okay? Now, I asked a few minutes ago, what was Jonah's treasure? What was so close to his heart that was causing him to be so angry? What was bubbling up here that was allowing him to be so furious about the Ninevites? And here's what I believe it is. I believe that Jonah's treasure is himself. That's what we see in his story. It was all about what he wanted to do, It was all about his own comfort. It was all about his own pleasure. It was all about his own desires. That's what Jonah cared about. That's what Jonah treasured. He was reigning supreme in his own life. And in just a few verses here, we see him greatly pleased when he gets his way and greatly displeased when he doesn't get his way. And if we're being honest with ourselves this morning, don't we have a tendency to be the exact same way? If we're being honest, don't we also have a tendency to be very pleased when we get our way and very angry when we don't? Don't we also have a tendency to be very concerned about ourselves? Don't we also have a tendency to be very focused on ourselves? In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter one. He says about the people, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator. And this is exactly what Jonah's doing. His focus was on the plant. His focus was on the comfort that it was giving him. His focus was on this pleasure. It was on himself. And I don't know about you, but in the same way, my focus is often me. My comfort, my pleasure, what I desire and what I want. The Jews have a very interesting tradition. Um, On Yom Kippur, when they celebrate the Day of Atonement, they read aloud the book of Jonah. And the reason that they do this is because they want to remember the condition and tendencies of their own hearts. They wanna remember that they have a tendency to focus on themselves. So they read the book of Jonah aloud and then they chant in unison, I am Jonah. And so this is the question that I want us to consider this morning. The question is this, am I Jonah? Knowing the story now, am I like this? Has my heart drifted to a place where I'm more concerned with my own comfort than I am with God's plan for my life? Have I drifted to a place where I'm more concerned with my own pleasure than I am with God's glory? And the Bible helps us answer this question because the story of Jonah gives us a few markers or a few indicators for a heart that is self-consumed instead of God-consumed. I think that Jonah's life can be a great diagnostic tool that forces us to ask, are these things true of me? So as we go through the rest of this passage today, that's what I want you to ponder. I want you to see these markers and I want us to ask ourselves, am I Jonah? Are you with me this morning? Here's the first marker that we see in Jonah's life. He had a lackluster prayer life, okay? We've read the entire book of Jonah. Jonah prayed twice in the entire book once when he was in the belly of the fish and once when he was mad at God for being gracious with Nineveh. Why is this important? It's important because Jonah only prayed when he didn't get his way. He prayed from the belly of the fish where he was uncomfortable and scared and he said, God, help me from this place, right? And he prayed when God did something he didn't like. That's it. He only prayed when he didn't get his way. He treated God like a genie. God, you're not giving me what I want, so I guess I'll pray now. Jonah had a lackluster prayer life. How about you? Is this also true of you? Do you spend time in prayer with God? Or does your prayer time essentially look like this? God, give me this. Help me with this. I want this promotion. Heal my loved one. Help me find a parking place, right? 
I think those are all great things to pray about. I think those moments should absolutely cause us to go before the throne of grace. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But if that's all your prayer life consists of, then there's an abundant life that you're missing out on. And here's what I found to be true in my own life. When my prayer is lacking, I can definitely tell. (laughs) I'm more irritable. I say things and do things that I normally wouldn't do. I treat the people I love in ways that they don't deserve. I care more about what people think of me than I should. I find my worth and my value and my performance. A lackluster prayer life and too much focus on me and my causes us to miss out on the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. So how about you? Do you have a lackluster prayer life? Okay, here's the second marker we see in Jonah's life, a self-righteous attitude. Throughout the entire story of Jonah, we see a self-righteous attitude. This started all the way back in Jonah chapter one, verse nine. Jonah tells the people, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens who made the sea and dry land. You can almost feel Jonah saying saying this with his chest, can't you, right? He's like, I'm a Hebrew. I worship this way. He's basically saying, I'm superior to those Ninevites, right? My worship is better than theirs. I'm good, they're bad. I deserve God's grace. They don't. And this self-righteous attitude is consistent all throughout Jonah's story, especially here in chapter four. Now, the interesting thing about Jonah chapter four is that many theologians and Bible scholars believe that there's actually a passage in the New Testament that mirrors this story, sort of like a a counterpart passage. There's been entire books written about this connection. Uh, It's Luke chapter 15, which is the story of the prodigal son. And I want us to look at this from a little different angle. The story of the prodigal son is a story about a father who has two sons. The younger son takes his inheritance early. We know the story, right? And he squanders it. He lives crazy. He acts wild. And finally, he loses everything and finds himself at rock bottom eating pig food, right? Not a great place to be. And in that moment, he becomes so distraught that he goes back to his father, thinking that his father is not going to accept him. But when the father sees him, even from a distance, the father runs to him, puts a coat on his back, throws a big party to welcome him back home. He says, my son was dead and now he's alive again. Big celebration, right? But what we forget about when we read the story of the prodigal son is that there was another son in the story. There was the older son, And I want you to see how the other son responds to this. Luke chapter 15, verse 28 says, then the other son became angry and didn't want to go into the party, right? He was like, I'm not even going in. He's sitting with Jonah with their snacks, right? We're just going to watch how this plays out. So what does his father do? He comes out, he pleads with him, but he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a goat so that I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him, right? What's he saying? I've done everything right. My record is clean and pure. My performance is 10 out of 10 and his is not. I've been obedient, he has not. And I think the reason that Jesus tells us this story in Luke chapter 15 is because he wants us to know that there are two ways, not just one, to miss out on the heart of God. There's the prodigal brother way and there's the other brother way. Both sons miss the heart of God. The prodigal brother way is deliberate and obvious disobedience, but the other brother way missed it with a self-righteous attitude. And that's the same attitude we see in the story of Jonah. But here's what we learn from both stories. God is not looking for more good people. He's looking for broken people who have been made new by the gospel. In the life of Jonah, his focus is on himself. He has a lackluster prayer life and he has a self-righteous attitude. How about you? And here's the third final marker we see in Jonah's life, a broken view of God's mission. Jonah had completely lost sight of God's mission. Let's take a look at the rest of these verses. Verse seven says, when dawn came the next day, God appointed, there's that word again, a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. 
as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and again he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, Jonah replied. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. God's saying to Jonah, look, man, your life is completely out of order. The man is angry enough to die over a plant. God says, you're worried about the plant. You didn't even water it. He says, I'm worried about the 120,000 people that I created who need to repent in Nineveh. Jonah loved himself in his own comfort more than he loved the reality of 120,000 lost souls being reconciled to God. He lost sight of God's mission in the world. How about you? There's a book that has really impacted my faith in the early days when I first became a Christian. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. And um, you can buy the book. It's a great book. But the first sentence, if you buy the book, if you don't like reading, read the first sentence of the book. It's all you need. You turn the page to the first page and this is what it says. It's not about you. And that's exactly what God is saying to Jonah. He lost sight of God's mission in the world. How about you? Let me really quickly remind you of God's mission in the world. God created the world and it was perfect. All right, it was beautiful, it was amazing. And sin entered the world in Genesis chapter three. And when sin entered into the world, God preached this verse that we call the first gospel. I wanna show it to you today. God said this to the serpent, Genesis chapter three, verse 15. He said, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, this is kind of a difficult verse to understand, but basically God is saying, sin entered into the world and it broke everything. The world us, the condition of the human heart, everything. But God says to the serpent, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to send an offspring to fix this and he's going to bruise his heel. In other words, he's going to have to injure himself. But in the injuring of himself, he's going to bruise your head. He's going to crush you and ultimately he's gonna fix everything that you've broken. This is God foretelling the story of his son, Jesus, coming to the world and dying on the cross to fix it all, all the way back in Genesis chapter three. So if you fast forward all the way through the rest of the Old Testament to the New Testament, this offspring, Jesus shows up and he says to us, just as the father sent me, I am sending you, you and me. God is sending us to preach the good news of Jesus everywhere our feet take us, but so often our hearts become like Jonah's. We get so focused on us and our comforts and our life and our desires and our pleasures that we forget the mission of God in the world. We idolize ourselves in such a way that we forsake the work that God is trying to do. Jonah had a lackluster prayer life. He had a self-righteous attitude and he had a broken view of God's mission. How about you? These are great diagnostic questions that we should filter our lives through. Do you have a lackluster prayer life? Do you only pray to God when you don't get your way? Do you have a self-righteous attitude? I would define that this way. If there is one person on this planet that you feel you are superior to, you have a self-righteous attitude. Do you have a broken view of God's mission? Have you forgotten that he loves every person on this planet? These are indicators that our heart has drifted into a Jonah mentality 
But my favorite word in the whole story of Jonah is the word appointed. God appointed a lot of things in the book of Jonah. He appointed a big fish to swallow Jonah. He appointed the Ninevites to turn to him. He appointed a plant to protect Jonah. He appointed a worm to kill the plant. And he appointed a scorching east wind. Why did God appoint all of those those things? For two reasons. One, he did these things to make Jonah both comfortable and uncomfortable. He did these things to reveal the posture of Jonah's heart. He's asking Jonah, hey, where's your heart really? But at the end of the day, the story of Jonah is a story of God's relentless and unending grace. For the rebellious, like the Ninevites, for the self-righteous, like Jonah, for you, and for me. And if you're at a place in your life today where you would say, I am Jonah, I'm a little bit like that, (laughs) then I have some good news for you. God is just one step away from where you're at today. He's just one prayer away. You can turn right back to him and he'll welcome you home with open arms. So let's do that. Let's turn back to God and experience this bottomless grace. Amen. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the strange and even somewhat humorous story of Jonah. Father, we thank you that there's a lot in this story that we can learn from. As we're often tempted to read scripture and think, man, these people are crazy. Jonah's crazy. God, help us not to have that mentality and instead help us to find ourselves in the story. God, where am I like Jonah? I pray that you'd speak to us today. Pray that you'd remind us in our own lives of your bottomless and unending grace that pursues us day after day. Father, we thank you that we're never too far gone and never undeserving of your love and your grace. So with heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching online from home and you're at a place where you're thinking, man, I am all three of those things. I'm just like Jonah. As I said before, God is one step away, one prayer away. All you have to do is turn to him. The Bible tells us that Jesus came. He lived the perfect life that you and I could not live because we all fall short. We're all broken. We're all sinful and imperfect. But Jesus came. He lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserve to die because the wages of our sin is death. We were destined to pay that debt, but Jesus came, stepped in our place on the cross, dying the death that we deserve to die, paying the penalty for our sin, and then he rose from the dead to give us new life. And if you call on his name, he'll save you. He'll restore you. He'll give you a new chance, a fresh start, make you new again, both now and one day an eternal, never ending life in his presence. That's the message of the gospel. And if that's where you're at today, you want to place your faith and your trust in Jesus. I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Church, let's make this our prayer together. Heavenly Father, I'm trusting Jesus to save me from my sin and to be the Lord of my life. I put you first. And I ask that you would forgive me, transform me, save me, and fill me with your spirit so that I can know you personally and share you faithfully. Thank you for new life. I give you all of mine in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You've been listening to the official podcast of Canyon Creek Baptist Church. If you made a decision to commit your life to Jesus or would like to get connected with Canyon Creek, Visit us online at creekfamily.org forward slash connect and fill out a connect card. Thanks again for joining us.